morning and I'd like to welcome everyone to this afternoon session of the Media, Arts and Activism um, Symposium. Yeah. Very pleased to um, be introducing you to our keynote speaker for the afternoon, who's Bonnie Jurek. But I will be um, handing over to my colleague and the curator of the Macquarie University Art Gallery in a minute to chair Bonnie's keynote. Uh, just to explain um, and to start before we start, I'd like to um, acknowledge the country on which we are speaking um, on today and acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land upon which the Macquarie University is situated, which is the Wollamadigal people of the Darug Nation whose cultures and customs have nurtured and continued to nurture this land since the dream time. We pay our respects to the Darug people and the Wadabagal clan and um, to their elders past, present and emerging. I'd also like to expend, extend that respect to all First Nations people here today and acknowledge always was, always will be Aboriginal land and that sovereignty has never been ceded in Australia. So the session um, goes uh, for about 50 minutes for the keynote. Um, we're going to keep people's mics on mute because we have quite a few people attending today. So if you have questions or comments and want to ask them of Bonnie when we get to the question and answer about um, just after half past, um, about 20, 25 to 3, then um, we'll read them out for you then. Um, and we are recording the session today and we will share it on the YouTube of the Centre for Media History. So I'll hand over to Rhonda to introduce Bonnie. Thanks, Justine. Well, welcome to this afternoon's session, which promises to be brilliant. I actually feel really honoured to be introducing the keynote speaker for this session, Bonnie Jurek. Bonnie is an acclaimed artist, activist, writer, and historian. Bonnie is the author of two monographs on the Parramatta Female Factory Precinct, and she is the founder of Para Girls, a support group for former Parramatta Girls Home residents, and director of the Parramatta Female Factory Precinct Association. Bonnie is the author of Histories on the Hay Girls Institution, 14 Years of Hell, and Parramatta Girls Home, Abandon All Hope. Bonnie has realised many individual and collaborative creative works significant to the history of the precinct and Parramatta Girls Home. As an artist, she has produced new work for six major memory project exhibitions since 2013, tireless work. Her advocacy on behalf of Paragirls and other forgotten Australians has been acknowledged in both state and federal parliaments. She is the recipient of a National Volunteer Award 2011, as well as the Parramatta Heritage Advocacy Award in 2013. Also Parramatta Australia Day Award in 2017. Bonnie is adjunct lecturer at University of New South Wales Art and Design, and she is member of the Order of Australia. On a personal note, I have great admiration and gratitude for Bonnie Jurek. My late half-sister was a forgotten Australian, wrongly institutionalised at Carlingford Girls' Home. She spent the best part of 10 years subjected to domestic servitude and robbed of the education she wished and deserved. Sorry. <laughs> Bonnie's courageous moral and intellectual work has given a voice to those subjected to such fate like my sister. Thank you so much, Bonnie. I'll hand it over to you. Thank you, Rhonda. Thank you. Well, um, Thank you for, uh, I welcome everybody, and, um, and I do hope that you find uh, what I'm presenting uh, informative, and I'd certainly encourage everyone to have some questions, um, which I'd love to answer at the, at the end. 
Um, today, I'd like to share with you a bit about my journey, uh, the influence of others I've met along the way, and how the Memory Project has harnessed art and activism to raise awareness about the history, heritage and legacy of the Parramatta Female Factory Institutions Precinct. I'll start at 15. All I wanted to do was study art at the National Art School. Back then it was East Sydney Tech College and by the time I eventually got there the name had changed. It took many years to finally realise this dream. I finally arrived at the National Art School in 2002. I knew this place had another history, a history of incarceration, of confinement, of punishment. Because of my own experiences, it was familiar, but not personal. I could read this place like no other, the sandstone, the cells and the graffiti scratched into the walls. All of this awoke a deep sense of injustice buried long ago and brought about a radical change in myself and in my approach to art making and a realization that I could harness the power of art to make change. Meanwhile, the Australian Senate Standing Committee were conducting an inquiry on Australians who experienced institutional or out of home care as children. Released in 2004 as the Forgotten Australians report, the committee found that upwards and possibly more than 500,000 Australians experience care in an orphanage, home or other form of out of home care during the last century. I was one of those Australians. Sorry, Bonnie, we're just wondering if um, we can't see your slide. So we're just wondering if you oh. can click from current slide or resume. Uh, maybe. Um, your screen sharing is paused. I don't know why that is paused. Okay, all right, I'll try that again. Thanks. Here it is. Share. Now, I don't know whether you might, you might have missed uh, two earlier uh, screens. Uh, yes, I think we did. Okay, all right. Well, uh, there's the first one. I'll just, just This is the work I did, um, I started to do at uh, the National Arts School. Um, so you can see here the sort of images and the graffiti and the cells, this whole memory and experience of the institution started coming forward and I, I started to play around with these ideas in my art making. Right, okay. Um, now this uh, here, this is the Australian this, uh, this was the Australian Stan Senate Standing Committee um, on Forgotten Australians. And this um, image here is uh, on the right. There's a bunch of uh, Parramatta girls outside the Parramatta girls' home. Um, uh, it's six o'clock in the morning uh, for our journey down to Canberra for the apology to the Forgotten Australians. And you'll see uh, the photograph at the bottom there is the uh, in the Great Hall where the apology was given. Right. Um, in the following year, that's in 2005, I co-curated co the Forgotten Australians exhibition at the New South Wales Parliament House. This exhibition represented the first attempt of people from this background to explore their history the effects of their childhood on their lives and to share this with outsiders in the form of art. Many people from the care background have shown works and exhibitions previously. And these have always been framed by others, usually welfare providers or government agencies and used to propagandize and, and advertise the good works of their services through the words or eyes of the client. This was the first time that care leaders had put on a show for themselves. Here is an eclectic mix of works created by a diverse mix of individuals, many of whom have never done art. 
uh, who came together with such resonance and passion that few can fail to be moved by the raw emotions expressed and the cruelty exposed. This exhibition was disturbing. A point driven home when a number of works were, were removed from display in the New South Wales Parliament because children might be offended by them. Sadly, those works, like others in the exhibition, explored and gave voice to the very real misery and brutality that was inflicted on children once under the direct care of the parliament. It seems ironic that they should have been censored for the benefit of children who live in a society increasingly filled with, with gratuitous violence marketed as entertainment. It was the heartfelt desire of all that these works would confront and inspire and help explain what happened to the forgotten Australians and continues to happen to children in care to this day. Encouraged by this, I felt the time had come to explore more of my own experiences, to share with others the deep forgotten history of the institutions of the Parramatta Female Factory Precinct. Emboldened by this, I climbed over the Iron Palisade fence of the deserted Norma Parker Women's Det Detention Centre with video camera in hand to document a place for which me and thousands of others will always be Parramatta Girls' Home. Piercing both time and memory, I entered the main building through an open window. It was a bold action, the consequences of which I could have never anticipated. Camera rolling, I made my way through the deserted building. Relying on memory to navigate the site, I made my way to the second floor where the dormitory I spent eight months in was located. It was confusing and confronting, but necessary in my search for answers. There at the end of the room was a mural of a small girl looking out across the sandstone wall. I suppose it had been painted by someone who, who had been there when occupied as the Norma Parker Women's Prison. It made me think about earlier times when the institution was an orphanage. Was this a child looking for her mother over the wall in the adjacent female factory? I got to thinking about all the children who passed through this institution. Who were they and what became of them? This thought stayed with me to take form in the Children's Day event staged in 2014. Now here is, a, here is the video that I recorded uh, on that first visit into the institution. Um, it's not, I don't think it's terribly long. How long is it? Well, it's 10 minutes. Um, I just might play half of it now, um, but it will give you a sense uh, of the camera shake because I was so nervous and terrified and and completely disorientated but it's a uh, there's a lot of black screen it's really about uh, it really gives you a sense of actually what it looked like when I entered it so it was darkness and and confusion and uncertainty so I'll just play this now Girls used to talk about dungeons under the walkway. Guess where we're standing? In a dungeon. And we're under the walkway. We are too. The, this is the main corridor under the main building. That must be where the front entrance is. Would that be right? No. No. Because the next no. one over takes you into the showers. That goes straight through. No, this the have to be. No, this would have to be the main. This would have to be the main corridor of the original gym oh, building. Okay. The gym building would have gone to that wall, and in here, as far as not that we can see. Steps there. 
Ah, oh, look what I found. Ah, oh, boys. So the girls have been down here. And this is the dungeon that they talked about. That probably thousands of girls knew about anyway, but no one was going to talk. We were silenced. So we've got here, send my love forever. You probably see a name there. Yes. Um, there's a name there's a name here. RM. Till I die. I love, worship and adore you. Is always. It, that looks like a date. 78. What, what, what's it? Is that a wall? What is that in it's, front of us? What was it? Uh -huh. It's a wall there of some are. kind. It is a wall. And here on this side, the left side, what's on there? Lots of writing here. Lots of writing. Okay. Wow, that's a find, isn't it? If it's there, it'll be in these other rooms. It'll be in these other rooms as well, carved in the wall. And we just can't see it. And this has all been scrubbed. Yep. It'll be in there too. We just can't see it. This uh, looks like writing just here to me. Right. That looks like another door. It does it too. Is. The light on the phone. And there's a window There's the wall, I can feel it, and there's an alcove. There's a slope. There's a great... Look at that. Look, look up here. Oh, and what's over here? <laughs> Come on, what's... That's the only ventilation in here. Imagine being locked in here. Oh. Look, there's writing. Is that writing? Yep. Yep. Oh, there's there's a lot of it. Sixty-four. Sixty-four. Is that right here? Sixty-four. Sixty-four. It'll be, there'll be oh, stuff here. Yeah, it's even engraved by Rose. Oh, I love there was a rose here when I was here. 
Rose, a little Aboriginal girl. Sounds. And they sent her to Hay. Now, what's that? Is that dead ivy? Yeah, it does look like that. And there's a name here. Jetty. Brown. Is it brown or something like that? on this side. Look, this. See that? Yep, got it. Well, this is one of the rooms. Nineteen sixty three, nineteen sixty two, Maz. See, the others didn't get a chance because they couldn't do anything, and they were freaking anyway. Oh, gosh, look at all of this. Sue. She's got 1990 written there. Someone's been back. 152, loves 39. Right. <clears throat> I hope I haven't frightened everybody too much. <laughs> and that's whenever I watch that, I'm back there at that moment and experiencing all those emotions. So it's um it's very, very confronting for me. And um, um, really, it's the first, uh, first entry into the mystery and the silence of that institution. Really, uh, this precinct, this institutional precinct, was a sleeping fortress whose memories and secrets needed to be reawakened. It needed to move from passive forgetting to active remembering, from silence to speaking out and from running away to standing ground. It was time to break the silence. This view that we're looking at now is the, is the front veranda of the main building and it looks over to the superintendent's house, cottage, which was located in the front yard which has now been demolished and where that used to stand is a memorial um, which hasn't yet been unveiled, um, uh, funded by the state government in recognition of the abuse that occurred within that institution. We hope to have that unveiling uh, in maybe February or March next year, but it's uh, taken uh, five years. so. Anyway, hopefully it will happen. Um, this institutional precinct is a place where thousands of vulnerable women and children were confined to the care of the state. Um, it had been, its history had been obscured by the lens of state propaganda and dampened by time. And as I delved into its history, I discovered that it was first built as an orphanage for Catholic children and that it was located to, next to Australia's first convict female factory. 
I soon realised that this site was ground zero in the long narrative of child welfare in Australia. With, foot's a plan, uh, foot's, with plans afoot for the redevelopment of this state-owned site and the decommissioning of the Norma Parker Centre in 2012, I took the opportunity to act on a recommendation made by the Forgotten Australians Report for the memorialisation of this former child welfare institution. Ill-equipped to take on this task alone, I came across another artist who had ventured into the dark space of the institution through her artistic practice. Her name is Lily Hibbard. Unlike me, Lily had not experienced institutional care as a young person. Her interest um, in, in confinement was prompted by her discovery of the race site of the Melbourne Benevolent Asylum, once the most prominent building in North Melbourne where she lived, which had been demolished in 1912. Like me, she was unsettled by dark tourism that suggests harsh treatments border on fiction. In her work, Benevolent Asylum, she speaks to this as simply another radical forgetting that confinement operates in precisely the same way in asylums, prisons and detention centres today, and that solitary confinement is a prevailing public secret of Australian punishment. In scrutinising both the history of institutional confinement and the relationship between historical research and creativity, Lily sought to imagine history as an active and shared practice that belongs to the whole community. But how can this be achieved? How can we as a community deal with tourism and historical forgetting, questions of preservation or participation at significant sites and the con uh, continu uh, continuation of covert practices like solitary confinement and forced detention? These were the questions that brought us together in 2011 and in 2013 we launched the memory project our aim was to bring together artists academics historians and former occupants to activate this historic precinct as australia's first site of conscience so that its history heritage and legacy would not be forgotten in the same year, then Prime Minister Julia Gillard announced a Royal Commission into institutional responses to child sexual abuse. Fortuitously, this brought more attention to the site and with that came the return of other Parramatta girls who, like me, sought answers. From the outset, Paragirls have been at the heart of what we do. The Memory Project has called for a multifaceted approach in the recording of oral histories through research and archiving, in the production of artworks, in the staging of exhibitions and events, lobbying politicians, and in contributing to the dialogue on why and how this site should be preserved and utilised into the future. Inspired by the International Coalition of Sites of Conscience principle, Memory to Action, the Memory Project has given Paragirls agency to tell their own stories, to interpret their experiences, to determine how they want to be remembered and how the site may be used in the future. This is a work uh, that we produced uh, in partnership or collaboration with the uh, National Institute of Experimental Art at the University of New South Wales in 2017. It's called Paragirls Past Present. Um, and it's an it extraordinary um, 3D work that was first screened at the Epi Centre uh, at the university um, in 2017 as part of the Big Anxiety Festival. I'll just play this. It's only a few minutes, quickly. They won my putting me in here, but they didn't beat me. No. Okay, they were the winners. They got to shut the door. But I'm standing here and it hasn't beaten me. I 
wonder sometimes, you know, whether the cover way signifies something or stands for something else, you know, between a past and a present. And I, and I, I knew it was sort of trouble, but many a time I, I couldn't help myself. I used to say, what are you looking at? And I couldn't help myself because you knew what they were looking at. Because not only did you have to watch out for the the male predators, you also had to be careful of the female predators. Girls who um, were put up in the loft to scrub, they would stand um, in one spot with a bucket and a scrubbing brush and they would scrub for 15 minutes, the rafter above their head, and then scrub 15 minutes of a, a patch, a square, a foot in front of them, and then up again. This would go on all day for them, and days after days as a punishment. I don't think you can walk through this place without hearing scrubbing. We never knew it was that was the significant part of the wall for me was that bit because over here we had isolation that hid a lot of the wall. So when you come past there, you see that wall and many of us used to wonder because we always thought of escaping, but we didn't know what was on the other side of the wall. Now, you can see from the beginning to this point and through the years, uh, thousands and thousands of people have come through the site. And these are just some, some images of, of some of the events and um, activities um, that we've had on site. As in the words of Maria Tamarkin, the memory project has taken people from isolation to community, from silence to voice, from social invisibility to cultural legitimacy, from looking away to looking at, from neglect to vitality, from victim to witness, from safety safely in the past to powerfully and palpably present. This brings me to the conclusion of my presentation and I would like to express my heartfelt thanks to the folks at Macquarie Uni who have been terrific um, over the years in organising this symposium. Thank you. Bye. Right. Oh, Bonnie. I, I had to leave then. I was so emotionally, um, yes, it was very emotional, that, that last film. Um, you amazing and um, there's a lot to be said and done. Um, so I was very interested in the way that you said that first entry into the mystery of, of going back into the place, the site. That's a reawakening the silence to speaking out. And I guess that's part of the healing process. And also being an artist, I think that sort of um, quickens the process in a sense. And I was very interested in the way 
So you said a lot of the women had never done art making before, but those expressions came out, you know, raw emotions from, from the experiences the girls had felt. Yes, yes. And um, there is a, there's a lot to be said when you get, uh, you know, a collective of people together. You know, you, you're, you've got your creatives and your stakeholders um, and others, you know, researchers, and, and you bring them together and, um, and you have conversations and cups of tea and so forth and a bit of laughter and a bit of fun and a couple of cuddles and all that. And wonderful things happen. And it's interesting, as uh, I was just thinking about that, that first visit in, you know, uh, into the darkness and finding all those names on the wall. And it really just then, again, the penny dropped because very soon after, a few years after that, of course, we got the Royal Commission into institutional responses to child sexual abuse. And during that process, it went on for a few years, um, uh, I had a lot of contact with detectives who were doing the investigations um, into allegations, uh, and I would meet with them very regularly, you know, numerous times a year, you know, um, because they saw me, uh, because I, one, had not put a claim in uh, for any sexual allegation so and that why I wasn't tainted in a way you know I didn't have a bias particularly and two because I had gone through that place and I documented everything because I'd gone down into those dungeons and into other places and I found those names on the walls and the dates and all of that and so when they took evidence from women who said I was locked in that room in this year and when I was locked in, I scratched my name in the wall and you'll see it, you'll find it up there above the doorway and blah in this position. So I was able to take those detectives into those locations and find those places and that became evidence uh, for later criminal prosecutions. So there you are, you know, and now all of the, all of that graffiti, all of that area has all been boarded up by the government. And I, uh, it's very fragile. I worry about it. I worry about the loss that's going on and the secrecy that continues, but at least it's been documented. So I just wanted to add that point about how absolutely necessary it is to bear witness, to be brave, to jump over fences and to speak up. Yes. Yes, Bonnie. You were certainly courageous. You're amazing. Um, look, I'd like to open it up to everyone and um, for, for discussion or comments or, or questions of Bonnie. Does, um, do you want to raise, raise your hand or just, uh, just unmute? And is there anyone out there? Can't see, or, or do it on the chat, if that's easier. Not yet, no, no. Um, the, the other thing, Bonnie, that uh, I was interested in is that intersection between tourism and significant sites. Did you want to sort of comment further on that? Is there? Yes, 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 I do, I do. One of the things I want to say is, uh, again, when I started off, nobody knew about, I actually named that site the Parramatta Female Factory Precinct. I came up with that name. It was just not known at all, it's known as Norma Parker Centre and Cumberland Hospital. So it need, needed a name, um, very important to, uh, you know, to locate and position it. Uh, and secondly, um, there's been, uh, there was nothing, there was just nothing known. And so I did all the research and I put up a website and started sharing information and so forth. 
And of course, it captured the interest of people who are descended from convicts and, and the general public, because, you know, most Australians who've gone through the school system have an awareness of our convict history. And, you know, that's, uh, you know, every, uh, people are very enthusiastic to embrace convict history and think, oh, that's great, tourism, blah, blah, blah. But they completely ignore the fact that we've had this 150 year history of basically child abuse that we can, we want to look away from still. And so one of the things that happens is that I'm constantly up against this battle uh, between this sort of populist history of convictism, you know, and those and 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 children. And I remember very early in the piece when I was trying to get some help and support uh, and interest, because I'm not, a, I wasn't anyway a historian, I guess I've become one, but um, I tried to get some uh, professionals to help me with that and I'd sort them out. Um, and I was told that they were not interested in the dirty history of Parramatta. They were only interested in the convict history. You, know, you can just imagine how I felt. So there's this, big trend and it's been established by you know places like Port Arthur and Fremantle Prison and uh, uh, Cascades in in a female factory all of these places um, you know where there's this, this expectation of a particular type of tur tourism and the trouble with it is as it presents people as uh, you know as entertainment and I can tell you the thing that really irritated me is that, um, and every other Parramatta girl and every other forgotten Australian who was in an institution, we are not there for people's entertainment. We are bearing witness to a history unspoken. And, and we do not want to be uh, depicted and used in a way that presents us that way. And this is one of the battles that I have currently with Property New South Wales, who I must say, some people within that organ are, are very sympathetic and others simply have no clue. So um, yes, because it's coming up to a, a, a point where next year, early next year, they'll start opening up um, some of that precinct, some of the precinct buildings and doing interpretation signage and, and digital displays and so forth. And I worry, and I have told them, that no Parramatta girl will, uh, you know, will agree to be entertainment for anybody. We are not there for that. But we, and this site must be used for what it can do, use its history for what it can do to change things now and in the future, not just to look back. We don't want to look back. We've had enough. You've gone through enough, the forgotten Australians. They endured sorrow and pain for a long time. And yes, that's so correct, Bonnie. And I, I hope you sort of um, get to the places that we need to go. And, and those sites are very important for educational purposes too, that we need to know these histories, these forgotten hidden histories that are difficult to talk about, but, you know, it's got to be put out there and that's part of the process that, that makes the healing happen, I guess. Well, it's not just about healing, it's about change. And, change. Uh, yeah, and because you have to actually say who, you know, in the future, 20 years or 30 years or 50 years or 100 years, people go to those sites and they'll have questions and they'll want to know things and um and let's while we can do the best to to share uh you know what it was like because we do not have one record one recording one image or even a dress of one convict woman We've got nothing, the silence of all those women who went through that earlier institution and the silence of all those children who went through the orphanage before us. That's what we contend with. And, you know, it's a, that's a great tragedy. But at least these days we're able to, 
do be heard and, and, and you know, make something for the future. So we're not constructed a particular way. Bonnie, we do have a um, question here from Nicole Matthews. Bonnie, thank you for your wonderful presentation. Can you say something about how art might move people who are not survivors or forgotten Australians beyond this frame of entertainment? Oh, gosh. Well, I, I don't know how, I mean, uh, you know, that, that's a very individual, uh, you know, subjective thing, how, you know, art, I can move people, but it's very subjective. I can't determine how people will respond to a work. Um, I guess the thing is that, you know, we, ha we have the, uh, a, a, such an array of media and forms these days that we can at least attempt to present as much of a like 360 degree view, if you like, um, into something that we could never do with uh, like a, a static image, if you like, or whatever. Um, yeah, it, it's really one of the things, the, it's the power of storytelling, I think, that really, and if that's in a work, that, that storytelling, whether it's just a two-dimensional work or, uh, you know, uh, moving or whatever, um, it's that that connects, I think, and that's where maybe the power lies in that story in that human connection. Yep. Thanks, Bonnie. Are there any other questions or comments? What time do we need to wrap up, Justine? Um, in a minute. So I think we could have one more question if um, anybody had a question they wanted to ask. No, uh, while someone's coming up with a question, I'll just oh, add. Do you know? Do you know? Have we got one? And Bonnie, yes, if you wanted to say something, please go ahead, Bonnie. Yes. Uh, like in the in uh, in this last year, uh, it's just given me a moment to actually look into my own sort of ancestry as well, which is um, you know there we are, um, and um, uh, you know in your in your own family you get stories told to you about you know great aunt this and that, and usually you know if you're a kid or you know think just not listen to that mum, you know like these are all dead rallies, who, you know kiss <laughs> sort of thing. Anyway, um, as it turned out, I thought I'll. Look, I should actually probably delve in because I'd heard about, you know, artists in my families and uh, scientists and things like that. And, you know, they're all very distant been 100 years ago sort of thing. But I found out that one of my ancestors, and I just wonder about, you know, how things come around. One of my ancestors was Australia's first anthropologist. His name uh, was Robert Hamilton Matthews. And um, he was responsible for documenting the Darug languages and many languages of Eastern Australia. He was a surveyor and, um, and he's buried actually at, at Mays Hill Cemetery in Parramatta, which I didn't know, I only found out recently. And he was actually buried on what, the 22nd of May, which is actually my birthday like 40 years before I was born or whatever, you know, but uh, which is weird again. Um, but it just makes me think, because I, I started sharing that with like uh, many of my sort of Aboriginal girlfriends and that, and Darug women, that sort of thing. And, and I said, oh, do you happen to know this bloke? And, oh, we know him. We've heard his name before, you know. He's responsible for this. And I said, well, I didn't know that, you know. So uh, it's almost like unfinished business, you know, if you sort of believe in... Um, you know, either like reincarnation or, you know, like carrying on in, in, in a family in a way, you know, it's like I'm doing that next stage of the work, you know. Oh, so. I mean, we've got a few coming in at the moment. We've okay. got Juno that wants to say something, um, okay. a dear friend and colleague, oh, Juno yes. Jens. I and I'll just um, also say from Duncan, his microphone isn't working at the moment, but just wanted to say that it was a necessarily harrowing but excellent presentation. Thanks, Bonnie. Thank you. Do you know, do you have, good to see yes. you. 
Hi, hi. I'm sorry I came late to this, but it was most powerful what I saw. And Bonnie, I just want to ask you, because we're facing a similar situation, trying to save Pete Island at the moment, which yes. has a similar history. Yes. Um, and, uh, you know, we want the history acknowledged. And how did you, were you responsible for dealing with um, that, um, you know, Figgy New South Wales, whatever is property New South Wales, to have the factory opened up as a space that people could enter? Um, this is my advice. Uh, a possession is nine tenths of the law. If you can get a room or something, a shed on Pete Island, you can begin. Whilst you're always outside, it's next to impossible. So, and I know I spoke to uh, some guy who was uh, part of the Pete Island group or advisor or something, and I suggested that to him. Um, but yeah, yes. That's but, fantastic. Yeah. Thank you, Bonnie. That is really. Uh, we're thinking of something like that, of you know, because the buildings actually are, are quite good, uh, you know, making an artist residency or something like that, where so we could invite people onto the site, right? Yes, yes, that's the way to go. Yes, getting that's brilliant advice. Thank you. If you have to camp, <laughs> create a camp, create a camp. Great, thank you. Thanks, Juno. We've got one more. Uh, have we got time, Justine? I'd like not because I can see people setting up. I can see people from the next panel. Unfortunately, not. I can see the question. It's a great question, but it um, is a great question. I have to leave. Can it. I put this to you, Bonnie? I'd like to hear more about what is meant by using these spaces to do something for survivors rather than just entertainment history about them. Well, the, the most important thing is acknowledging the people who went through these places and experienced it. It's people that animate place, not place animate people. Um, so without the people, it's 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 meaningless. It's just architecture. Um, yeah. So I'm probably not answering that properly. Um, anyway, that's the best I can do for the moment. So. <laughs> Thanks, Bonnie. It was just brilliant, absolutely brilliant. Could sit here all afternoon, couldn't we? Yeah. So do, I, do I go off now, Justine? We'll just give Bonnie another round of thanks and people have posted in the yes, chat. Yes, yes. Well. Thank you, Bonnie. Brilliant. Thank you.